Hi everyone, I'm Stacy with Team Soul Navigation and welcome to Talk Show Tuesday. Recently, I had the privilege of sitting down with Henny from Team Soul Navigation and we had an amazing, brilliant conversation around the secrets of the planets. The conversation was so in-depth and amazing that we decided to break it up into two parts. So tonight you will be viewing part one and next week you will be viewing part two. So grab your beverage of choice, get comfortable and enjoy the episode. Hi everybody, I'm Stacy with Team Soul Navigation. Welcome to Talk Show Tuesday. I am so excited for this week's episode. We are talking to the amazing, brilliant Henny, and we are going to be discussing the secrets of the planets. Welcome Henny, how are you? Hi Stacy. I am very, very well, thank you. Here in London, the weather is getting nicer ever so slightly I, I just heard from you it was snowing where you are so <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I hope it's not too cold um but yeah I'm very well thank you and I hope you're safe and well as well thank you I hope you and your family are also so let's explore the secrets of the planets and what I find interesting is that you mentioned that there are secrets that are like thousands of years old that maybe people aren't necessarily familiar with. What would you say is, first, let me ask you this. What would you say is the most important planet that we have that can affect us? Ooh, wow. That is a very tricky question because you know what, Stacey? I think that the, the practice of astrology that I had, I do is that all of the planets in our chart affect us. Um, but I guess on an individual basis, it is the ruler of your rising sign. So mm -hmm. to me, that's the most important planet for you as an individual. And then I guess if we want to talk about like the literal effects, it's going to be the luminaries, the sun and the moon. Uh, you know, if you, if you walk out um, into the sun uh, without any sunscreen or sunglasses we can really get affected and the moon as well uh, we know the effects of the moon on the uh, you know the menstrual cycle and um, on the waters of the world um, and so they they the moon and the sun I think definitely affect us um, in both ways mm -hmm. uh, spiritually and literally speaking and then also the rest of the traditional planets are going to be the ones to me where we are most sort of feeling the effect. So that's going to be the rest of the traditional. So Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And then we have the remaining three. We've got Uranus, we've got um, Neptune, and we've got Pluto. And um, to me, they, of course, do affect us. To me, it's just that it's more on a sort of generational level. Um, it's more on a kind of, I always describe it as like a backdrop sort of hum type of energy. It's not like right in front of our faces. It's not like the moon or Mercury even, which is often going retrograde. Um, it's much harder to capture or to, to recognize even and better actually for us to notice in hindsight. So I often find when we look at our transits, you know, if, um, if um, Uranus has gone through a whole one of our houses, we kind of, feel its effects after, <laughs> um, in however many years after. Um, so that would be my answer. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And I know you are such a brilliant astrologer and you really like to get to the depth of like people's souls when you do your readings for them. And I think that it's so amazing. So if you have not booked a reading yet with Henny, please, please, please check them out because they are an amazing reader here at Soul Navigation. Henny, I'd like to, let's talk about a little bit more about the sun and the moon, because I think since the beginning of time, that's what humanity has sort of known about. And I'm sure that there are tons of secrets around the sun and the moon. So would you like to share some of those with us? Oh, yeah. So, so in contemporary astrology um, or modern astrology, whatever we want to call it, we often um, are told that the sun rules Leo. And there's definitely a lot of crossover. There's definitely a lot of similarities between the sun and, and Leo. Literally the sun <laughs> in lots and lots of different artistic interpretations looks like a lion's head. Leo is the lion. So that's just one sort of thing that we get there. The, the cat. <laughs> the sphinx um 
but um, the sun is actually more, even more than in Leo, even more powerful in the sign of Aries. Wow. And um, we might kind of make that connotation because Aries is also a fire sign like Leo. Mm -hmm. But the real reason is because the sun um, and, and Aries, rather, Aries marks the beginning of the brand new year, which we're about to be in ourselves in about a month's time. We're about to be in Aries season. Um, so when the sun is in that sign, it's like it couldn't get any better because the sun is the planet of illumination. It's the planet of realization. It's a planet of giving life, um, revitalization, um, hope and happiness as well. And mm. when we put it in Aries, it's putting it with all that spring energy, that brand newness. And it doesn't matter if you're living in the Southern hemisphere, this is spiritually speaking. So it's when we inside get that spring feeling when our resolutions as well actually feel like they can actually be started on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, maybe some of us have been trying for the past couple of months to, to keep up with some resolution and hasn't really been working. And that might be a, a spiritual reason because the real beginning is Aries season and the sun um, really, really, really loves um, to, to, to light up this season most or this sign most. I love that. And I, you know, that's a great point because when we think about Aries and we think about, about the spring equinox and that sort of blooming, well, it would also be the autumn equinox depending on where someone is in the, the hemispheres. But it, in order to kind of grow something, we do need the sunlight for that. So it's, it's like your own personal resurrection that somebody may be going through right now and can harness that with the sun, depending on where that is. Uh, it's that, are you familiar with Stonehenge at all? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you, you have beautiful. <laughs> it's, it's on my list of places to go once everything kind of opens back up around the world. But I watched something interesting recently where, you know, many people think that Stonehenge was built around the sun. And mm -hmm. there's evidence that perhaps shows that maybe it was meant to sort of track the lunar cycles. Oh, okay. And about mm. how, you know, if we go back to the history of humanity, there's mm. that hunter, hunter and gathering um, mm. part of humanity before agriculture really took on. So mm. they felt that it was more where it represented the stages of the moon. Mm. But do you have any secrets that you can share with us about the moon? Because the moon can be, I find the moon, the moon delightful, but also mm -hmm. mysterious. There is something very yeah. magnificent behind the moon that in mm -hmm. it's knowledgeable. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. There is something very magical, mystical. I did not know this about Stonehenge. That's fascinating. I'm going to look that up later. Um, <laughs> I'll send you the documentary. Um, it was on Amazon. Please do. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, the moon's kind of fascinating because the sun, of course, gets all the attention. And um, one of my friends recently said, actually, um, that the sun is, you know, the sun never changes its face. It's constant, whereas the moon is always changing its face. Mm -hmm. And um, I think if we were to, th there's some way, you know, if you were to put together the sort of suns traveling through, um, through the signs or through the sky and the moon at the same time, the moon kind of snakes around um, the, the moon like that. So it's kind of snake energy almost, the moon. Um, and so it does have a lot of mystery. It has a lot of um, illusion. Um, and I think in the, in the, in the tarot as well, um, the moon um, card is quite often associated with uh, Pisces. Mm. I think at least traditionally speaking, um, and Pisces as well, we're in Pisces season right now, a season of mystery. And I often say that Pisces is sort of the, the second exaltation of the moon. Um, <laughs> the moon likes to be in Pisces secretly <laughs> because that is, um, the, the most removed, I think, from reality, the most removed um, uh, from the mundane. Um, and the moon, what's really interesting about the moon as well is while the sun gets all the attention, I think that the moon in traditional astrology, uh, we need to uh, bring this back that the moon actually represents the collective. So the moon mm -hmm. represents all of us together. And if you imagine like a, a sea or an ocean uh, the tides of that massive body of water are controlled by that planet. Yeah. And so that's no small feat. 
Um, and, you know, there is a, a joy as well that the moon has in the third house. Uh, of our birth charts and this is something else that's really interesting and amazing and um, that not many people know and another really cool um, and sort of I guess secret thing as well is that the moon in traditional astrology for the longest time has represented actually the collective um, the, the entirety uh, quite like Pisces is often represented actually the whole globe the world um, and if you think of a sea or an ocean and how the, the moon is said to, to control the tides of that, that huge body of material, material of, of water, um, that's no small feat. Mm -hmm. And then in our birth charts as well, if you know how the houses work in your birth chart, look to the third house and see if you have the moon there in your chart, because that's also a kind of secret thing. The moon is in joy in this house and the reason is that and not many people know this but the reason is that the the moon is actually the most receptive of all the planets the moon is the most intuitive and we often kind of nowadays separate intuition and intelligence but they're, they're the same thing to me <laughs> they're the yeah. same thing um and i think emotional intelligence has been kind of put on the back burner but we quite often can feel something before we can sort of logically process it right and yeah. actually our mind right you probably agree with me maybe Very much uh, so. but our mind often talks us out of our gut instincts right yes <laughs> <laughs> um and so unlike mercury it's the moon that actually is the fastest processor and receiver of, of information really and um, but it's emotional information and that's why it's at its joy in the third house and not Mercury. Um, and, and because the third house is about um, intelligence, the third house is about that sort of uh, learning on a very, very local, right in front of me, right around me level. Do you feel like if there was one sign or one house that the moon just really doesn't like to be in, what would you say that would be? <sighs> hmm. That is a tricky one, Stacey, that's a very tricky one. So I would say maybe, maybe the 10th house, yeah, maybe the 10th house, just because the 10th house in your chart is sort of the highest part of the chart. It is where um, in your life, themes of the public, themes of the biggest action are, are coming through. It is um, also things like the father <laughs> um, mm -hmm. in, in, in traditional astrology. And the moon is much, much more about the inner, the inward. And as we just talked about um, intuition um, and, and receiving. And um, when the moon's in the 10th house, um, it might even be that um, your mother, was um, quite a public figure or your mother was quite uh, out in the open or your mother was even quite distant from you because um, of being uh, somehow in public or somehow um, yes yeah, so maybe ha having a very official position or very important job or something like that and so there's this like sort of distance between um, the mother up in that house and the, the much more sort of personal houses uh, at the bottom of the chart. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for explaining that. Um, let's talk about Mercury a little bit because mm -hmm. everybody, I, I think everybody loves all the planets. I, I feel like whatever planet I'm talking about, that's my most favorite planet at the time. <laughs> but um, when we talk about Mercury, we know that that's like the planet of communication is, is traditionally how we would view Mercury. But is there anything that Mercury like what goes beyond just communication? Because I feel like there's so much more there for Mercury that maybe we're not always tapping into that we can you know, work with the planet rather than trying to work against it. Oh gosh, yes, Stacey. And, and well, first of all, I'm so happy that you said that you like all of the planets because I do too. And um, all of the planets are important to us. They're like our magic powers. It's our magical arsenal. And um, I hope people are continuously finding ways to utilize um, one planet at one particular time, you know, like uh, just finding the, 
the the right moments mm -hmm. <laughs> to to unleash the 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 gorgeous beauty of all of the planets and um i do hope we get to discuss that as well today how um it's actually a secret that all of the planets are good or all of the planets <laughs> can do good you know um but 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 yes mercury um yeah a lot of us say it's the the planet of communication and i think that that's there's some accuracy in that like it is about you know information um systems and um kind of intellect and uh, being very clever in the in the mental and the cerebral that kind of thing um but you're right mercury is so much more and one of the things i love about mercury one of the secrets is that mercuries are also about mercantilism um or business and um not many people know that or they do but they forget about it with mercury and that wherever you have mercury in your chart can tell you how you can actually be very business savvy how you can actually strike very good deals um and it's it's about not just being able to talk the talk like mercury is often famous for um but being able to sort of channel mercurial energy into a deal or a trade with another person um mm -hmm. which is a whole other kind of skill uh, because you're 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 kind of you're being crafty <laughs> to, to 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 get something for the price you want it or to sell something for the price that you want it at you know traditionally in the markets this is, this is a very traditional version of mercury but mercantile energies that's so mercury and even beyond this mercury is about um flitting between um worlds or dimensions uh mercury when i think of mercury i think of archetypes like um um, Nightcrawler in X-Men, for example, who is um, a teleporting X-Man. Um, this is very Mercury, so someone, something, some archetype that can travel great distances very, very quickly and, and usually also is very youthful, um, very funny, very crafty, very clever, very foxy as well. It's kind of like a fox sort of spirit, fox archetype. Um, but yeah, time travel, that kind of thing is very mercurial. Um, there's a lot and also um, Mercury is exalted in the sign of Virgo and this is very interesting as well and um, because you know Mercury in Gemini does very well as well um, very comfortable in Gemini um, but because Gemini is quite an outward energy that can get us into trouble if we aren't <laughs> handling our uh, Mercury and Gemini energy well but Mercury and Virgo it can the Virgoan energy kind of brings it more inward it brings the energy to the darkness again so each sign represents either the darkness or the light and Virgo is bringing Mercury into the dark so starting to get Mercury to just be more introspective um, and 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 to I guess think a little bit more before the speaking comes out um, so that's I think part of why Mercury is exalted in Virgo. So let us know in the comments if you have any of these exaltations that we're talking about, because we'd love to know. I have a, <laughs> I have a question for you on that point. So, you know, mm. with each zodiac sign, how we can have, I'm not quite sure the terminology, but we can have more of the mature aspect of that zodiac sign. And what I like to call the growth aspect of it, meaning that maybe it's a bit more in the shadow where there's still some learning and some maturity happening with that. Do any of the planets, can they affect us differently based on almost our, our knowledge of the planet or almost like our awareness of it? Do they have those different aspects within them where there's this duality? I think yes if i if i'm if i'm understanding correctly i think yes there is some um sense of the, <laughs> the like if we're if we're not connected to one of the planets let's say um for whatever reason or if we're even choosing to ignore <laughs> the, the the planet's lessons uh, and gifts then i think what happens that that planet still plays a role in our life it's just that we no longer have much uh, choice or free will over that because we um we've made that choice right or, or we just haven't uh considered it and uh, what can happen is the energy has to play out somehow so it will just play out the planet will play out and um it will play out in any way that is of the signature of that planet so mm -hmm. 
let's say we are ignoring our, just because we're talking about Mercury right now, let's say we're ignoring our Mercury, then it can play out in, um, from the very, very little to like, you know, constant typos in our emails, um, you know, just um, blurting out the wrong thing in conversations and social situations um, to, to, to much heavier or more serious things where you, you um, your mercury is completely out of control and you uh, tell yourself things that are very damaging to you, you know, um, and they, they're they part of your shadow, shadow side, but you're also not working with your shadow side. And so the planet can actually really start to uh, be very dark for us. Um, so I think, I think that's uh, maybe, does that maybe answer that question? Um, it does, yeah. The duality, yeah. Because um, I think, yeah, they, they kind of, they, it's, it's, yeah, it's like we, we, we study the stars and the planets and we try to learn from them. Um, and it's not that they, they cause us to do things necessarily, but that um, if we refuse to learn certain things from them, then um, we're going to learn the lesson eventually anyway. <laughs> yeah, we, I, I have found that, you know, there's when we need to learn a lesson, especially from maybe one planet, whether it's Mercury. I mean, we just got out of a Mercury retrograde right now. So and we're still I... in this post shadow phase of it. And I still, I, I honestly feel sometimes even with the post shadow that I'm like, there's that Mercury retrograde happening, you know, with the technology or with uh, wrong words coming out or misspoken emails. And it's like, I think Mercury gets a lot of attention just because we're used to it, at least in the a spiritual community, because of yeah. perhaps Mercury retrograde, which comes every, I mean, I think it happens three times a year, but it feels like every time it just happened and then it's come back again for a retrograde. So I think yeah. that that planet does get a lot of uh, extra attention sometimes uh, in our lives. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I love Stacy that we, we talked about, in this order as well, the moon uh, to Mercury, because right now it's the full moon in Virgo. So we have, mm -hmm. so if you are watching and you have natally the moon in Virgo in your third house, then this must be a crazy weekend for you. Let us know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely let us know how this full moon is impacting you or has impacted you uh, since they'll be watching it next week. Yes, but, uh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you mentioned that all of the planets tend to work together in this harmonious way. Have you found, like, I don't really know a whole lot of history about astrology, like when it first started or how it was discovered and how certain ancient cultures used it for things. Because I, there must have been some misperception at certain times in history of what the planets were. I mean, even certainly with the sun and the moon and, and how that worked, but what would you say, what planet holds the most interesting keys of secrets throughout history that we can Ooh. kind of crack open? Oh, this one is saucy. This one is very saucy. Oh my gosh, Stacey, it's so hard because there's like two planets I want to talk about for this question. Um, <laughs> well, we, we got time. So how about we talk okay, about okay. both? Okay, let's talk about both. Let's do both. <laughs> um, and, oh, by the way, I also wanted to say, as we were talking, as we were talking about Mercury, that another secret to Mercury is that, uh, and you mentioned Mercury retrograde and how it's such a popular thing now. Um, a lot of us we want to get really frustrated at Mercury, right? We want to hate, hate on Mercury uh, for the retrograde and everything. But the secret to Mercury retrograde for us is that Mercury is just trying to teach us the non-severity of life, of everyday life. Mercury breaks your computer or um, cancels your bus to see if you can ask yourself, to see if you can bring spirit in to say, well, this is not such a big deal. I'm still alive. I'm still going to get to my destination or, you know, I'm still going to have a good day. Um, Mercury stirs things up for that very deliberate reason um, where things are not really that deep. Um, and, and that's deep, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so don't hate on Mercury, everyone, too much. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I've learned to just say thank you. Thank you, Mercury. Thank you. <laughs> and, yes, yes. and just kind of pause and come back to it if need be later. Mm -hmm. 
And Mercury is yeah. a trickster as well. So be careful what you say about Mercury because <laughs> <laughs> you might get tricked up. Yeah. Um, oh, so yeah, to go back to your, your next question, um, Venus, let's start with Venus first of all. So we know from um, history and looking at the, the Mayans, for example, that Venus has in different cultures or in different parts of the world had a very different um, purpose um, compared to what we might know or think of Venus now. We might think of Venus as love and our love language and Venus as pleasure. Um, the Mayans made blood sacrifices to Venus. Um, mm. The Mayans had a, um, a whole calendar devoted just to Venus, not just to the moon or to the sun, to Venus. That's how important that planet was to the Mayans. Um, and some of these sacrifices, um, they got pretty like, they got pretty intense. I mean, that it was mainly men, to my knowledge, who would do it. Um, and that's very interesting as well. So mainly men would make these blood sacrifices and they would cut, um, not just anywhere, but they would, um, when it got really feisty, they would cut their, um, their nether regions um, as an offering <laughs> to Venus. And that's fascinating to me. And, yeah. um, and I do associate Venus in my readings as well. Or I try to describe Venus as the planet actually of blood and flow and circulation. Uh, we often talk about Venus as vibe, like what we like, but that is really kind of like blood. If you think about it, your mm. blood flow, you know, if yeah. you're feeling good, if you're in the zone, your blood is flowing, you're, you're well. Um, and that's a, a Venusian thing uh, that's rooted in, um, in something quite um, dark sometimes or, or, or very like, uh, because this is another thing, right? Maybe you agree with me, Stacey, but sometimes Venus gets a bit downplayed as just a planet of love or the planet of, I don't know, soft things. But Venus, mm -hmm. don't mess with Venus. <laughs> like, <laughs> don't mess with don't Venus. Don't mess with Venus, yeah. The planet itself is hotter than Mars. Not many people know that either, but it's hotter than Mars. Um, and uh, well, you, you wouldn't want to go on and walk on any of the planets, to be honest, but Venus is very hot, very deadly. Um, and Venus heavy people, they, they have this way where the dark side of Venus can come out. Um, you know, <laughs> this can be, oh my gosh, you just reminded me of, um, there was this case in Florida over there in the States actually, um, of this woman who was murdered by one of her past partners. Um, and this woman, she, uh, she must have been very Venus heavy because she loved clowns. She loved clowns and her whole house, everything was like clown themed, uh, clown parties. Um, she just loved clowns and she created art about clowns and all the rest of it. And um, obviously her ex-partner knew that and um, showed up at her door. And it was one of these like revenge killings um, and um, dressed up as a clown. And she not freaked out like a lot of people would be if a clown if a clown showed, <laughs> showed up. up she yeah. was she was like happy overjoyed right <laughs> venus is joy and pleasure and whatever you like and love um but of course that led to her um sad uh passing um and and this is the dark side of venus as well be careful what you attract and be careful what you are liking uh, and vibing with because there's something all the planets can kill us just like they can bring us life all of them can kill us and venus kills us with what is sweet <laughs> and um and what looks nice and cute mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe fatal yeah yeah oh my gosh reminds me of um snapped i don't know if you're familiar with that with that show snapped no yeah. tell us about this show <laughs> I've only seen it maybe once. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm maybe not the best person to describe the show, but I think it it goes with people who, um, it's usually about romantic relationships and they mm -hmm. reach a particular point where they kind of reach that breaking point and they snap mm -hmm. and they do something that is usually detrimental to themselves or to their partner mm -hmm. and their relationship usually ending in sort of a, a murder uh, in this particular mm -hmm. show. So it, it, it has, I mean, because with love, it can be, it has both aspects, right? It can be mm -hmm. really loving and it can be almost like vengeful mixed in with yeah. that love. So to your point, we have to be kind of careful how we maneuver through these planets sometimes. 
And you mentioned that yeah. there was a second planet that sometimes mm -hmm. um, went through with ancient cultures and stuff. What about mm -hmm. the second planet? So the second planet that I had on my mind is actually Saturn. And um, Saturn, you know, I think what, up until the 17th, maybe not that early, maybe the 18th or 19th century, we didn't even know about the existence of Uranus, Neptune and Pluto. Um, we only knew Saturn to be the furthest away. And so for a lot of time, Saturn has been associated with death, with ends, um, with cutting like a, the glyph itself in your birth chart most likely looks a little bit like a scythe. Is that the word? Like a scythe? Mm -hmm. um, looks very sharp, you know? Yeah. Uh, you wouldn't want to run into that kind of shape. But um, Saturn uh, has been associated with things like the Grim Reaper um, across time and, and place. And um, also one thing that's really fascinating about Saturn is like I often describe it as the guardian of the bounds. And so um, but if you, we can think of it literally because we literally thought it to be the last planet of the solar system. Um, but Saturn always knew of the other planets on the other side. We just never did. So Saturn was always this lonely archetype on the edge of what was known just sitting and waiting for everyone to to discover and um this is a really interesting side to saturn that we really rarely talk about um in modern astrology but saturn it, it it is a cold archetype it is about you know in traditional astrology as well it's about dampness and like mold and um um uh cold um but it's also about isolation and meditation and being um kind of yeah as I say on the on the bounds of something or the edge it's mm -hmm. about ostracism as well Saturn being ostracized it's about extremities like um uh, polarizations as well um and also Saturn's about feigned appearances which is really interesting um we don't often we would maybe associate Venus with fake things but actually it's Saturn that um has had this association for a long time with uh, the fake um or keeping up appearances um so it's very fascinating. Um, and I like to think of, um, so in the beliefs about the Fae, for example, there are many different um, sort of spaces where it is said you're not supposed to um, meddle with or cross over. And Saturn is kind of like this archetype of these spaces uh, that are between uh, reality and um, the non-reality or the other dimension, you know, like fairy rings um, yeah. or certain other spaces uh, in, in different cultures there are different versions but um you know places you're not supposed to go uh, unless you're ready to face uh, what could happen to you on the other side you know you might be taken um into the fairy ring um you think it's been five minutes it's been five uh, decades and mm -hmm. you come back and all your family and friends are gone or, or moved on you know um Saturn is representative of what is there, always kind of warning us, um, but also always kind of knows, <laughs> already knew what was beyond. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's amazing. And that that's just so fascinating. And I think Saturn sometimes gets a little maybe misrepresented, you know, because we often think, at least for myself, you know, I, I've always thought about Saturn as this like, kind of like a party pooper in many ways, you know, like the, the person that shows up to a party that just doesn't want to have any fun. And, <laughs> you know, where it's like these karmic lessons and these harder elements, but, but there's really something almost fascinating with Saturn that it's like, if you allow yourself to step beyond that void, and kind of go into that door that there's there's great re rewards sometimes working with Saturn and especially Meredith covered it in her recent Saturn videos yes. she did a great job and exploring the different aspects of Saturn but it's so it's so powerful for Saturn and we would think or at least uh I would think sometimes because Jupiter is the biggest planet right mm -hmm. and my knowledge about Jupiter is it's this planet of expansion and it can bring abundance and change. And that's my extent about what Jupiter is. But 
I would imagine, because it doesn't matter necessarily about the size of the planet, right? Mm -hmm. It's more right. so the elements of the planet and what they're working with. And, and you've mentioned it plays a role individually in somebody's chart. Mm -hmm. um, but what would you say that maybe Jupiter can, because sometimes I feel with Jupiter, it adds a little bit of like, almost like it's the spice on top of the dish where it can be like, do I want to go with rosemary today? Do I want to go with saffron? What's the, or black pepper, you know, what, what's that extra element to deal with? So what are your tips or secrets for Jupiter? <laughs> I, I really like that idea of Jupiter being like the spice, the spice <laughs> of life. I love that. Um, yeah, it's true. Jupiter, uh, <laughs> or uh, yeah, Jupiter brings the jupes, brings, brings the, the flavor. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> and and yeah you're right I think yeah I totally agree that in contemporary astrology Jupiter has this much more positive reputation uh, compared to Saturn Saturn is often the party pooper the the CEO uh, the father um, you know all these sometimes stereotypical um, interpretations um, whereas Jupiter is kind of this bigger than life sort of archetype Jupiter is this jolly uh, person um, Jupiter is the bringer of luck and abundance. And I think in terms of like the really traditional sort of interpretations, Jupiter is one of those where it is still pretty much how it's interpreted um, mm -hmm. in contemporary times. But um, one of the things that people, well, a couple of things. Um, first of all, Jupiter, as you mentioned, but in some practices of astrology, Jupiter is considered to be actually about heaviness, heavy things, um, heavy lessons. And so um, that's very interesting as well, because Saturn is very often associated with like the Punisher. It's just that with Jupiter, the edge, I guess, is that it's usually shorter for one <laughs> than, than Saturn, because uh, Saturn is even slower than Jupiter. But Jupiter always gives us, I think, this silver lining after mm -hmm. some bad lesson jupiter even if you've gone through something really really traumatic um jupiter still provides that sort of mm, little inkling of wisdom no matter how small it's there um but jupiter is also about law and um things like propagation and and those types of things can get very serious very quickly those types of things can get very um blown out of proportion and as you mentioned it's a big planet and people with a lot of jupiter they can get very preachy they can get very um zealous they can get very um uh, my way of the highway as well um which is interesting uh, and jupiter is so close to saturn you know mm -hmm. and so there's it's no wonder that there's this mix-up i would say between um saturn which is just more really about being serious and cold and on your own and Jupiter, which is more actually about the authoritarianism and the do it my way and the um, propagations. Um, another thing about Jupiter, which is really interesting, is that um, Jupiter, yes, about luck and abundance. Um, so in your chart, it represents where things are kind of easier, usually. So you have an easy time with those themes. Um, but the trick is that Jupiter is giving good to everyone every single person whether that person is the evilest person you've ever met or it, it's you, you yourself who's trying very very hard right in this mm -hmm. world to connect with spirit right um jupiter gives good to everyone but what's happening is that jupiter that the the spirit of jupiter is to help those who are good of heart to make the most of what is given whereas those who are not good of heart uh, and you know it we can all become good of heart if, even if we're not right now we can all you know i'm not saying that we can't um ever not be good or not be pure if that makes sense and um, but um jupiter kind of um just gives anyway to these um not so good people or things um and it's like treacle i describe it as like treacle um so jupiter gave you a cake but jupiter is now putting like treacle honey molasses like everything is going over that cake that you got from jupiter and um, it's going to be too sweet for you. It's going to be toxic for you and it could kill you. That's how Jupiter can kill us. <laughs> Jupiter mm. just keeps giving. It's like, um, you know, the story um, Midas, was it Midas and the, the Golden Touch? Oh, the Golden Touch, yeah. 
Yeah, it's like that. That's a very, I think that's a very Jupiter type thing as well. Like you want something, okay, here you go. But um, you, you wanted it for selfish reasons, for example. So you're going to get exactly what you want, but it's really not what you want. <laughs> um, yeah. That's Jupiter. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> it's kind of reminding me a little bit about like clear quartz. I don't know if you're too, if you're familiar with quartz or not, but like clear quartz magnetizes things. So ah, it's, you yes. got to be careful with it because it can be like, if you're, especially for somebody who's like empathic and they wear like a clear quartz um, out in public, mm -hmm. it can magnetize everybody else's emotions that you're feeling. So oftentimes oh, like wow. we look at clear quartz and be like, this is a great stone because it is like a master healer stone, but it can magnetize mm -hmm. everything else around you. So you got to be careful like when you use it. So it sounds like, you know, Jupiter, you got to almost be a little careful how you're maneuvering that Jupiter and, and what you're asking for, because exactly like the, I think they call it the Midas touch, right? Cause he could touch things and it would turn to gold. And yeah. then I think he ended up, you know, turning um, so much stuff into gold that it ruined him. And in, in yeah. that, in that, um, the story of, of Midas and King Midas. I, I think, was it, his daughter as well, even that got turned to gold. I think that's what happened as well. I wow. think so. I yeah. definitely feel like somebody from his family, but it's been a really long time since, since I've heard that story of King Midas. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so beware everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Jupiter. <laughs> and you and, know, I, if, sorry. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, cause you mentioned that Saturn and Jupiter are, are close together. They're like neighbors. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we would think that some of that energy would come from Saturn because it does have that kind of karmic element to it. Um, mm -hmm. But, but there's always, as with, you know, Saturn, as with any planet, really, there, there are all experiences to be had to learn from yeah. those. So I think that it's also, they all kind of play together in the same playground, so to speak, that are, that are really mm -hmm. like working for our betterment. Because if things were always sort of this wonderful experience all the time, we wouldn't really be able to maneuver or know, mm -hmm. uh, I, like even light from dark, right? We wouldn't be yes. able to know those without each other. So I think that it really is really set up in such a magnificent way that, that helps us gain information on both elements of of each planet's duality within ourselves mm -hmm. and then within the collective at the same time and then universally of course mm -hmm. I, I totally totally agree it is um yeah working you know spirit astrology it is working with both the light and the shade and mm -hmm. and you, you totally bang on like each planet has both the light and the shade and <laughs> we are in that playground as you say uh, <laughs> working with it and and you know if, if you've got um for example jupiter in the 11th house in your birth chart that's a blessing a huge blessing because jupiter is in its joy in the 11th the house of friends and allies and hopes and that's amazing you've got jupiter in that house it's gonna mm -hmm. be rained down on with <laughs> hopes but <laughs> keep in mind what we just discussed like um be careful what you wish for as well that's an yeah. 11th house thing and um with saturn the joy is actually the 12th house that house of losses that house of incarceration and uh, that house of um undoing so it's very interesting because you're putting this archetype of let's be serious and let's guard the border um you're putting that archetype in the 12th house so it actually can be a blessing for someone with saturn in the 12th um it can feel very lonely and isolating um, you could, but you could also become like a sort of hermit type um, who goes on a very um, independent sort of spiritual journey. That's very Saturn in the 12th. Um, it's joy in the 12th. Mm. <laughs> so since we're talking about Jupiter and Saturn quickly, mm. what would you, how would you say if somebody was born with a Saturn Jupiter conjunction? Because we just mm. recently had a Saturn Jupiter conjunction on December 21st in 2020. And I'm sure that there were some, some babies born around the world uh, on that day. But how do you think that those two can be impacted in a conjunction on someone's natal chart? Mm. Well, I think um, if we consider what we kind of talked about, Jupiter being about expansion, 
um, or enlarging or magnifying. I love what you said about the crystal quartz and the magnetizing. If we, if we go along those lines for Jupiter and then we go along the lines of seriousness and um, um, uh, sort of seriousness and stillness um, and a kind of solitude for Saturn, then you, can, you could get a lot of different things. You could get someone, for example, who's hugely, hugely um, <laughs> sort of like, um, yeah, like a hermit, like a huge hermit type of person. It doesn't mean you literally become a hermit or a monk or something, but you have that spirit about you where you could um, be perfectly content on your own in the middle of a forest on a mountain. Um, or even if you're in a massive crowd of people, you, you can feel a hugely um, on your own, but but very um, comfortable with that. So that's the kind of person, if you're having a baby, if you had a baby <laughs> around this conjunction, that's the kind of person they could grow up to be. Um, and it could be, it can go in some other ways. It could um, be someone who is a very um, severe or serious about what they believe in, because Jupiter is again about these convictions and propagations. And so it could be someone who um, has a huge wealth of knowledge, but they're also serious about putting it out there. And it could be a huge teacher. Oh my gosh, they could be a huge teacher of some kind, any kind. Um, they could be a very um, fun, uh, abundant um, type of father as well, this person, um, or father type. Yes, yeah, so a lot of things. Lots of things. I, I would like to discuss um, Mars for a second. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, traditionally Mars, I think, gets associated with like the warrior element and right. the, the doing uh, mm -hmm. sort of aspect of it. And it's definitely, I, I don't know, to me, it just represents, I'm, first of all, I'm grateful that we only have a Mars retrograde every 18 months. <laughs> And, but it's usually always in alignment with that Venus retrograde too. Mm -hmm. So I feel like when the Mars and Venus uh, retrogrades happen in the same year, it's balancing out almost the, the masculine feminine within everything because there is both in everything. But how would you, how would you describe um, Mars in a way that maybe people misunderstand Mars energy mm -hmm. or how they can tap into some of that, that greater knowledge of it. Cause it almost reminds me of maybe like um, when we had, I forget the exact um, name of it, but like when people went on the quest for like the Holy grail, it kind of mm. Mars reminds me of like this quest that people go on for almost like the truth or um, attaining something what Mars kind of reminds me of but how would you how would you what would you tell people about Mars that to maybe help them understand that in an even greater way or things they may just not be aware of how to use it or work with it mm. I love I love what you just said there about the quest Mars being about a quest that's amazing yeah I do think that there's something going on there that Mars is this um, go out and get type of energy. And yeah, it, it does have this reputation of being the angry planet, the angry archetype, the, the, the <laughs> warring archetype. But one really interesting thing, it's a few things here to say. And we're actually going to, I think we should hop back to Venus a little bit right now because you mentioned Venus as well. So what's interesting about Venus is that um, during the Roman Empire, Venus was a goddess of war actually um and then later became <laughs> uh sort of more um softened and more about let's just uh, be pleasant and mm. diplomatic and what's really interesting about the roman empire and even contemporary italy is that it has so much um libran and aries energy in, in in the birth charts of these places um and it's very cardinal but also very much a mixture of Venus and Mars ruled energies. And so you can think of like Roman Empire diplomacy was very, uh, it was very cruel and co colonial. They would go to a particular place and they would basically show their might and they'd be like, we're either going to kill you all and enslave you all, or you surrender now and we'll civilize you um, and you'll be a 
a protectorate of us or whatever the case might be. Mm-hmm. Um, that was how Rome dealt. And that's kind of like the very dark fusion of um, <laughs> Venus and Mars. Um, and, but then after that um, sort of the fights or the, um, after the um, interaction, there is the, 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 um, the, the Roman architecture and the arts and the literature and everything kind of flows and, it's, and you would never think anything Martian ever happened, right? But this is Venus can Venus can get into war absolutely, and Venus can be very interested in um, the spoils of war. And I think we 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 tend again again to downplay Venus and be like, oh no, it's all Mars, it's all Mars. Mars is the one that wants to fight. Mars is the one that's taking and killing. Um, but no, um, as you say, they do have this relationship, the two of them, where they they can easily want the same thing and it can easily be the same bad thing um and mars i think one way of understanding um a secret about mars is that in traditional astrology mars is in its joy in the sixth house and the sixth house is the house of illness it's the house of problems it's the house of toil all that stuff we don't want to do but we have to do um and mars is about killing right mars is about as you said, going on a quest or seeing things as a quest, taking on. Um, So then it all of a sudden becomes good. I mean, why would Mars be at joy here? Because Mars gets to get rid of illness. Mars gets to um, Mm -hmm. knock down your obstacles. Um, And so Mars has so many good sides. Um, And I love, you know, when I first got into astrology, there was something I noticed about Mars as well, how Mars is very much this energy that stands up for the underdog. Martian people, like Aries heavy people especially, they tend to stand up for people being bullied. Um, Scorpio risings tend to be like this as well. Also Mars led. They will not be afraid to, um, even even people they don't like or get on with, if they see other people saying bad things unnecessarily about that person or being unnecessarily harsh to that person, even then that Mars led person will say something and step out. And I find, find that to be a very honorable quality, mm. um, very gutsy as well, but also very authentic and in, integral. So Mars is definitely about integrity. Mm. Yeah. Would you say that since we mentioned it for, for uh, Venus, but mm. is there like a placement or a sign that maybe Mars just does not like to be in? Uh, yeah, I think there are, <laughs> Mars is, I mean, let's talk about this astrological year, 2020, 2021, we're almost over, hallelujah, but um, this, that year for Mars has been awful, because Mars had that retrograde mm-hmm. in in its home sign, or its domicile sign of Aries, um, which wasn't great, and then Mar- Mars had to deal with a lot of squareage from the other planets in Capricorn, and then eventually got out of Aries, but then into Taurus, which is a sign it also doesn't really like to be in because it's very, very slow. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And, but one thing I do think about this year that's good for Mars is that it's made Mars kind of wise this year. And we are also getting kind of wise about um, our actions, wise about, what we throw ourselves into why is about the full card energy you know that's also very kind of aries mars mm-hmm. why is about what we jump into what cliffs we jump off and um and then yes i think mars is very soon going to enter gemini and then uh, i think mars will have a great time in gemini and then it's going to go into cancer another sign where it doesn't really like to be <laughs> and then it's going to get to leo where it's like finally and, and it's fire again as well and then it's going to get to um virgo which is like oh, okay um and then libra where mars um really doesn't like to be either and then i think it's really only from scorpio season that mars gets a good long <laughs> run mm-hmm. um so yeah, Mars, I mean, but this is a planet of enemies and killing enemies. So of course, Mars would have a lot of signs where it doesn't really <laughs> like, to <laughs> like to be. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know I have Mars in Pisces. And the first time I ever went to a, an astrologer because I have my moon in Aries and mm-hmm. they happened to mention like these two would love to be reversed, you know, where to have my moon in Pisces and then um, my Mars and Aries, sort of speak, mm-hmm. because Pisces, I guess that Mars just is not a fan of 
I think aside from a from Scorpio, I, I think Mars just may not necessarily like water signs because it's a little bit more emotional uh, than Mars may like to look at. It's kind of making the warrior a little bit vulnerable. And sometimes that's just uncomfortable for people to, to kind of feel like we're not fully bringing it all to the, to the table, so to speak. Absolutely, yeah. And, and, and I often describe Scorpio as the secret fire sign um and so yeah that makes sense to me as well like not really liking to be in cancer and pisces but maybe more in scorpio um yeah yeah there's this sense of yeah we're putting fire in water so it, it's going to be very down and especially i don't know maybe you can tell us more about your experience but mars and pisces i often think of as like being uh submerged um <laughs> your, your your anger and everything is kind of submerged <laughs> in water and it can be like this um it's like you know it's like sharks you know have you ever seen sharks kind of a lot of the time even though there's lots and lots of different fishes around them they can just be cruising and cruising around for quite a while and then they'll suddenly have that snap moment that strike mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like that for me uh, um or like a panther that is hiding in the shadows of the jungle for so long and then jumps out eventually. <laughs> yes. I have found that that sometimes I don't know if it's the Mars element of it, but but sometimes where maybe perhaps people get away with things that maybe they they would otherwise not get away with things. Mm -hmm. Like uh, the one thing I can think of without sort of outing myself here is in high school, I used to, me and my friends used to walk around without a hall pass and oh, no one would ever stop us, you know, so we just be walking the halls, no hall pass. Um, but it, it allows, you know, it's a little rebellious Mars, but I don't know. I, I feel like there's this, this aspect that, um, like you said, like that Panther, and it, it's kind of reminding me, I don't know why Spirit's showing me this, um, but there was a movie, oh gosh, I can't remember the name. It was an um, M. Night Shyamala movie. I think okay. it was, oh gosh, I don't remember, but it was about this mystical creature that would almost blend in with the grass. And um, I think it was, uh, it might've been Lady of the Water or something very similar to that. Um, but, and there was a mermaid, I think she was a mermaid that sort of lived in the water, but she was a very mythical creature. And then this mm -hmm. other mythical creature would, would kind of peek through. And if she stepped out of the water would come grab her. So it, it reminds me a little bit of that, um, the precision of mm -hmm. knowing when to make this move kind of a mm -hmm. thing with it. So very fascinating. Um, I love that. yeah. Is there anything other than all of the amazing things that we talked about thus far, mm -hmm. is there anything that you would want people to know about this sort of secrets of the planet or, or planets and anything that will benefit them of working with all of them together? Mm. One thing, there's a couple things. So one thing that I recommend people to do is first of all to not worry too much about it because <laughs> especially nowadays we have a lot of contemporary astrology which also adds a lot of asteroids a lot of this a lot of that and it can quickly become very overwhelming and you don't want to be you don't want to obsess or worry about it with spirit and uh, this is just like one lens one way to see things but we always have to be able to step back from the birth chart or step back from the telescope um, and live our lives to the best of our abilities and the best version of ourselves um, so don't worry if you're having a day where you feel like you're not harnessing enough venus or you're not harnessing enough mars um, because actually there are days where it's better to do so and there are days where you kind of have to put in the cupboard some of the planets and bring out just one or two of them. Um, and that's normal. I mean, the, the, the gods themselves in many, many mythologies, they were portrayed as being quite um, um, absent at times <laughs> of, cri of crisis uh, or, or, you know, only some of them would come out and they kind of would be on a rotation, you know. Um, 
And you have to think of your chart like that as well sometimes. It's like your spirit guides. And Stacey, you have a brilliant talk show Tuesday as well on spirit guides, which I loved mm. watching, by the way. It was amazing. But it kind of reminds us of this as well. Like um, maybe not all of your spirit guides come down at once, right? Every single time, but they come when they in particular are needed um, for a particular situation or obstacle or message. Um, and but if you want to get more in touch, you can um, look at a website like planetwatcher.com, which is free. And you can actually literally see where all the planets are and then look at your chart and kind of trace that back. And you can um, decide for yourself, OK, well, Mars is in my seventh house for the next month. Um, let me in my relationship, for example, try to be a bit more Martian or avoid more negatively Martian type things. And you can kind of say one or two things to yourself about each of the coming transits for the month and then just like close the book <laughs> and let everything kind of happen let the rest happen and wash over you um that's one thing you can do and another thing is that within your own breath chart and this is a kind of secret and a lot of people ask about um their empty houses where they don't have planets in what you want to do is you want to look to the sign that starts that house where you have no planets and then look to the ruler of that sign. So let's say you have Virgo starting what that sign. So Mercury is the ruler of Virgo. You're going to look to see where Mercury is in your chart. It's going to be somewhere. Find Mercury. And that's going to give you so much secret information as to how you are actually, how that empty house is actually connected to Mercury. You will be mind blown by what makes so much sense to you now <laughs> once you just look at the rulers of your 12th houses. Wow. And I think that with that, everybody should make sure that they book an appointment with you because <laughs> you really, uh, you get to such depth of someone's soul with it where, you know, sometimes it can just help somebody even understand themselves in a, in a greater way of like, wow, I didn't, I always knew that, but there's a form of validation that can come yeah. from understanding yourself and understanding how the planets work uh, within the birth chart, because it really is so fascinating because ultimately we kind of picked when we were going to sort of pop into the world and know all the planetary alignments and even thinking like, yep, I can handle that. I can, <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> I got that, you know, I got it. Uh, but wow, this has been so, uh, so fascinating. Um, I just even feel like there's so much from, you know, maybe even, and maybe this is a topic that we can do for a different talk show too, say, and I think you'd be brilliant at it, but maybe explore, exploring astrology through history and how yes. different times, because I would bet maybe even like the middle ages, I feel like astrology was maybe viewed differently too. And I know that there's other, um, I forget the term of it, but there's sort of a, a astrology system that was in place where Mercury was at the center um, mm. of the universe and it changes the rotation of the planet. I love it. And the collective. Well, Henny, this has been so amazing. I'm <laughs> so happy I got the chance to talk to you. And I definitely think that perhaps exploring some of those other planets like Uranus and Neptune and Pluto, because those planets mm. I'm sure have lots of secrets all within themselves too so perhaps that is something that we can explore in a different episode and definitely if you'd like to explore those other planets leave us a comment below and let us know you know if you have any questions or how this resonated for you and again everybody should take the opportunity to have a reading with henny they are amazing they, they will blow your mind with the astrology knowledge that they will be able to read your chart with and really get to the depths of your soul and you know explore other things on soul navigation and we thank you for joining us Henny, do you have any last words for everybody just to be just be and to stay safe and well and uh yeah i look forward to reading your comments uh, later as to how you resonated and as to how you find these uh, secrets of the planets so thank you and thank you again Henny. it was so nice to have this opportunity to talk with you and stay safe and everybody watching, thank you for joining and have a great day. Thanks. Bye, Stacey. everybody. Thank Bye, you. Henry. Bye.